Support for This American Life comes from Squarespace. Squarespace is the all-in-one website platform for entrepreneurs to stand out and succeed online. Whether you're just beginning or managing a growing brand, Squarespace makes it easy to create a beautiful website, engage with your audience, and sell anything. And with Fluid Engine, creativity comes easy. Start with a best-in-class website template, and Fluid Engine lets you customize every detail with drag-and-drop technology. Head to squarespace.com slash American for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use offer code American, and you'll save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. A quick warning, there are curse words that are unbeeped in today's episode of the show. If you prefer a beeped version, you can find that at our website, thisamericanlife.org. People are complicated. That's my radical message for you today, America. People contain their opposites. I personally, for example, can be a good listener, helpful to others, and also exactly the opposite, totally inattentive. And I don't think I'm very unusual when it comes to all that. In fact, something I always find kind of annoying is when people say, I'm a good person. Oh, yeah, sure, I did whatever, but, you know, I'm a good person. He blah, 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 but he's a good person. Really? I think it says nothing real about you at all. Because most of us are a mix of good and bad, right? We have thoughtful days and we have annoyed days. To me, somebody who says, I'm a good person, is somebody who is not taking a very serious look at everything they do, who they look out for and who they neglect, and all the things they could be doing for others if they really were so good. To be clear, there are good people out there. There are genuinely generous, good people. I've met them, we've all met them. But in my experience, one thing they have in common is that they know better than to sum it up with the words, I'm a good person. Because one of the things that makes them good people is that they know that they contain kindness and awfulness, light and dark, depending on the moment. Years ago, I had the unusual experience of having dinner with Tom Hanks. And one thing I loved about Tom Hanks is how annoyed he was at this reputation he has in the press of being such a nice guy. You know, journalists write entire articles about him, and that is the angle. He's such a nice guy. If I had to sum up his attitude towards this, at least expressed in that one conversation, he said basically, I'm normal. And so when I meet a stranger, or when I'm in a work situation, I do what normal people do, and I try to act pleasant. And then there are other times in my life when, like anyone normal, I get irritated. I get angry. I'm not so nice. People contain their opposites. Which brings me to Jerry Springer, the king of trash TV. When he died two weeks ago, it made me think of this story that we did about him years ago, about this whole other side of him than the one most of us think of. And that's his political career. This was early in his life. He was deeply idealistic in a kind of John F. Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy kind of way. And I actually found this very moving. Springer had a hard time walking away from that part of himself. That part of him, as you'll hear when you hear the story, stayed very much alive inside the Trash TV host as years passed. So uh, today on our show, what we're going to do is we're going to play you that story, which we first broadcast 20 years ago when Springer was still in the prime of his daytime TV career. Uh, This was part of an episode that we called uh, back then Leaving the Fold, all about people leaving some world that they had once inhabited, leaving some part of themselves behind, and how they missed it once they were gone. So we have that. We have some other stuff. From WBEZ Chicago, it's This American Life. I'm Ira Glass. Stay with us. Act one, he contains multitudes. So um, let's start today with our story about Jerry Springer, first broadcast in 2004. One of our producers at the time, Alex Bloomberg, grew up in the city where Springer was mayor, and he put this story together. Jerry Springer arrived in Cincinnati in 1969, fresh out of law school with a job at a downtown firm. And in just six months, he announced he was running for Congress against the conservative incumbent. He was 25. He had no experience. Nobody had ever heard of him. But he was against the war in Vietnam, and he supported civil rights. And here's the thing you might not guess. He was fantastic. Patricia Gary and Gene Galvin are both Cincinnati political veterans. Here's how they remember him. He was absolutely the most gifted, natural politician I ever saw. 
the grandmothers all loved him. The daughters all loved him. You know, the brothers and sisters, everybody, you know, was a good friend of his. They were great. I mean, he, there was always that a kind of a glamour around him, you know, where he was clearly a golden boy. I, I put Springer at the level of Ronald Reagan, uh, Bobby Kennedy, uh, Bill Clinton. He's that level. And it's not just local Cincinnati people who feel this way about Springer. Mike Ford met Springer back in the 70s, but has moved up in politics and is today a Democratic political strategist at the national level. I worked with Clinton, 90, 92, 88, Dukakis, um, 80, I worked for Kennedy. 76, I went through Birch by Mo Udall and Jimmy Carter. He's the best I've ever seen. Bar none. Hey, welcome to the show. How you doing? My guests today say they're cold-hearted mistresses who are proud to be breaking up marriages. Please meet Holly. She says she does more than just babysit her friend's three kids. Holly, what is going on? I've been screwing my friend's husband. It's kind of a long drop from wanting to save the world to hosting TV shows with titles like I Have Sex With My Twin and I Want To Be A Teen Stripper. The story of Jerry Springer is the story of an act of transformation so complete and so total that most people don't even know it happened. It's really the story of two Jerry Springers, one known only to a pocket of people in southwest Ohio as the heir apparent to progressive politics in America, the other known the world over as the king of trash TV. Go ahead, tell her. (laughs) Teresa, I've been screwing your husband. And he loves having sex with this. Oh, he was Kennedy-like. Very bright. This is a comparison that comes up a lot when people talk about the other Jerry Springer. And it's no coincidence. The summer before Springer first ran for office in Cincinnati, he'd worked as a volunteer with Bobby Kennedy's presidential campaign. Here's Gene Galvin. When Jerry got to Cincinnati, he had a a Boston Boston slash Harvard slash Kennedy accent. He doesn't have it anymore, but when he got here, he had it. If you hear any old tape of him from that era... Uh, see any video clips, uh, Jerry Springer came to town talking like uh, Bobby Kennedy. My campaign is based upon the proposition that the answers to the problems which currently plague our cities, our towns, and our homes are not to be found in the decisions in Washington. They are instead to be found in the hearts, minds, and resources of our own people here at home. On old footage from this campaign, Springer looks even younger than 25. He looks like a kid in one of his father's suits, pretending to be Bobby Kennedy. But crowds loved him. He seemed like somebody reaching for something big, even when he's talking about business prosperity and the gross national product. The GNP by itself is no mark of our national achievement, for it includes smokestacks that pollute, drugs that destroy, and ambulances which clear our highways of human wreckage. It includes a mugger's knife, a rioter's bomb, and Oswald's rifle. But if the GNP tells us all this, there is much that it does not tell us. It says nothing of the health of our families, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. Springer was running in one of the whitest and most conservative parts of a very conservative city against a 10-year incumbent, and he lost that first race. It was the last time he would lose an election for the next decade. One year later, he ran for and was elected to the Cincinnati City Council. Tim Burke was his legislative aide on the council. Jerry could go into a VFW hall and talk about why he was opposed to the war in Vietnam, and that was not a popular thing to do. He wouldn't convince VFW folks, at least not the majority of them, that they should come out against the war in Vietnam. That wasn't in their nature. But he'd walk out of their room, and they'd like him. And this is the remarkable thing about Jerry Springer, the politician. Again, longtime friend Gene Galvin. He has connectability that transcends specific viewpoints of people. He get votes from West Siders saying, I don't agree with anything you say, but I just like your style. I like your guts. The result of this was that on city council, Springer had an uncanny ability to bring a marginal message without actually marginalizing himself. Again, here's Tim Burke, Springer's legislative aide. In 1971, when Jerry was elected to city council, um... There was a proposal to build 
Riverfront Arena. And the proposal was to do it with public dollars. And the original vote on council as to how that was going to go was an eight to one vote. Jerry was the only one who opposed it. Opposed doing it. Opposed doing it with public dollars. The day of a critical vote, two members of council were away and it needed seven votes in order to meet certain of the procedural requirements. Jerry refused to give them the, the procedural vote, which had been the tradition. You don't hold something up on a procedural vote. You're free to vote against it on the merits, but you don't hold it up. Well, Jerry bucked tradition and then started just talking about why this was a bad thing to do. And we ought not to be publicly financing these things that ought to be supported by private business. And in the end, he captured the attention of the citizens of Cincinnati. They rallied to his side. The other politicians on council got that message. And Riverfront Coliseum was built with private dollars, with very little public subsidy involved. And you don't see that happening in stadiums and arenas today. Oh, it really got you going, I'll tell you. Guy Kuchenberger is a Republican and was one of Springer's council opponents on Riverfront Coliseum funding. He says it wasn't any fun being on the other side of an issue from Springer. I mean, he'd, you know, make a public appeal and uh, state a public position for an issue. And, you know, you were either you either went with him or you were the bad guy. I mean, you didn't make a choice then. In 1974, Springer got elected to his second term with more votes than anyone else in city council. Six months later, he resigned in a scandal. An FBI investigation into an illegal massage parlor across the river in Kentucky revealed that he'd been a repeat customer. How did they know? He'd paid for a prostitute with a check. Tim Burke was his legislative aide at the time. Um, we went something like 10 days in a row with the headline story in the Cincinnati Inquirer. Jerry was going through all kinds of personal hell. So was his wife, obviously. So was his family, as he had to call them and explain to them what he had done and what it was doing. And this was a, this was a young man with an absolutely terrific career ahead of him, and it looked like it had all been destroyed. And you personally, what were your thoughts? And part of it was, what the hell were you doing? Um, you know, why would you throw away this terrific political career you had in front of you for a few minutes? At the time, it seemed that people weren't angry at the act as much as they were at the sheer stupidity of paying for it by check. But Springer was clearly shaken. The minute the facts became public, he resigned from council. So quickly, in fact, that his colleagues seemed a little shocked. I think Jerry would tell the story that his initial thoughts were, I'm going to resign, I'm disgraced, I'm leaving town, I'm going to go start a new life someplace else. Within about 24 hours, he and his wife, Mickey, and, and his other friends decided that wasn't the way to do it. And he held another press conference. And he just said, here's what happened. Here's what I did. I'm ashamed of it. I apologize. And just came absolutely and bared his soul to the Cincinnati public and they rallied to him again. It was amazing. People were, <laughs> some of the nuns out of the College of Mount St. Joseph started, started a thing where they were sending stones and little, little pebbles to members of Cincinnati City Council trying to encourage them to reject Springer's resignation with the message, he who was without sin should cast the first stone. You know, it was just, it was tremendous the way that people responded to him. And that was really what started his comeback. After a few months, Springer took tentative steps to get back into public life and mounted another run for city council. The Democratic Party wouldn't endorse him, but they did leave a spot open for him on the ballot. Gene Galvin went with him to campaign. The St. Patrick's Day parade in Cincinnati at the time was huge, huge. Ran through the downtown streets. Thousands of people would come. You'd hope for great weather. And on this day, we had great weather. A tremendous crowd. And as Jerry would come down through the crowd, they jeered him. They mocked him. And some of it didn't mean they wouldn't vote for him, but they mocked him. Hey, Jerry, you got a check on you? Hey, Jerry, you're really stupid, aren't you? Why'd you write a check? Just yelling all this stuff. And he would just sit there and smile and laugh and take it. And uh, boy, my heart was kind of breaking for my buddy up on that back seat because I'm down driving this car. He just, he just took a beating. Still... The campaign worked. 
18 months after resigning from city council in disgrace and admitting publicly that he'd paid for a prostitute with a check, Jerry Springer was elected by the citizens of Cincinnati to a third term on city council. Two years later, back on the Democratic ticket again, he was elected mayor, this time with the largest vote total in the city's history. It's not going too far to say that less than four years after being caught writing a check to a prostitute, Jerry Springer had become the most popular politician in Cincinnati, ever. Partly because he was able to mock his own stupidity. A rock and roll radio station convinced him to record a spoof commercial, a takeoff on a popular credit card ad at the time. Hi, do you know me? My face is seen all over Cincinnati constantly. But when I travel, say across state lines, people don't know the difference between Jerry Springer and Jerry Ford. So that's why I carry this, the American Expense Card. It's the card that's good at thousands of clubs and motels across the river. I can even get instant, hassle-free check approval. For quick, enjoyable entertainment, it can't be beat. Just like me. Most people, if they know the story at all, they know it wrong. They think Jerry Springer was mayor, there was a prostitution scandal, he resigned, and then had nothing else to do but become the Jerry Springer of the Jerry Springer show. The truth is much stranger and more complicated. Jerry Springer became mayor after the prostitute, and the Jerry Springer show was a full decade and a half after that, during which time Springer left politics more or less on his own terms and then rose again to the top of an entirely different field, television journalism. The president of the local Teamsters Union in Cincinnati in northern Kentucky is warning trucking companies to send trucks out in convoys after midnight on Monday. This is Jerry Springer as he was known to Cincinnatians throughout the 80s, local news anchor. Here's how he got there. In 1980, he stepped down as mayor to run for governor and lost in a tough three-way race. When it was over, he was out of money and jobless, so he accepted an offer to anchor the local news at Channel 5, the lowest-ranked local news program. In a fairly bold programming move, The station also let him end the broadcast with his own nightly commentaries, which were often of a liberal bent, pro-union, anti-Reagan and Bush. He ended the broadcast each night with his signature phrase, take care of yourself and each other. Springer spent 10 years at Channel 5, during which he brought the nightly news from last to first in the ratings and earned 10 Emmy Awards. He attracted notice, including offers to host his own show. In September of 1991, the first Jerry Springer show was taped. Soon afterwards... Jerry Springer left Cincinnati for good. His final commentary on the local news is legendary. Okay, bear with me. This will be a little tough. You should know this isn't the first time I thought about leaving. I thought about it some 20 years ago when a check that would soon become part of Cincinnati folklore made me see life from the bottom. To be honest, a thought about ending it all crossed my mind. But a more reasonable alternative seemed to be, hey, how about just leaving town, running away, starting life over someplace else? You see, in political terms as well as human, here in Cincinnati, I was dead. But then, in the probably the luckiest decision I ever made, I decided, no, I'm staying put. I would withstand all the jokes, all the ridicule, I'd pretend it didn't hurt. And I would give every ounce of my being to Cincinnati. Why, in time, I was thinking, you'd have to like me. Or if not like me, at least respect me. And I'd run for counsel, even unendorsed. And I'd prove to you I could be the best public servant you ever had, or I'd die trying. Be it as a mayor, an anchor, or a commentator, whatever it took, I was determined to have you know that I was more than a check and a hooker on a one-night stand. But something happened along the way. Maybe it's God's way of teaching us. I don't know, but you see, in trying to prove something to you, I learned something about me. I learned that I had fallen in love with you, with Cincinnati with you who taught me more about life and caring and forgiving, and also, most importantly, giving, giving something back, which is part of the reason I have been, excuse me, so sad this week. Why why it's so hard to say goodbye. God bless you and goodbye. Amy, you have a friend, Rusty. Let's now welcome him to the show. Here is oh, Rusty. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Come on, Rusty. What's up, tough guy? What's up, tough guy? Oh. Come on. It wasn't immediate, the switch from the nightly news to this. Originally, the Springer show was meant to be the successor to Phil Donahue. And indeed, the first year's topics included homelessness and gun control. Springer booked political guests like Oliver North and Jesse Jackson, 
and the show seemed innocent and upstanding. One early show bears the quaint title, Single People, on the Outside Looking In. But the ratings tanked, a new producer was hired, and, well, you know the rest. For those from Cincinnati, those who know the other Jerry Springer, watching the show can be bewildering. Again, here's Patricia Gary, who used to work with Jerry back in his city council days. Well, first off, that doesn't look like Jerry. What, what is it about him? Do you think that when you see, what do you see when you're looking at him? On the television. I don't know. I, you know, I'm wondering, I mean, is he even in there? You know, where is Jerry? And, but he's, he's still got that outward, you know, he can be happy with the microphones and, you know, and, and smiling and all that. And then he does that little pseudo commentary at the end. Um, you know, where's that positive energy? Where's that belief that he can make a difference? Where's that uh, wanting to make a difference, that striving, that, you know, it's always shooting upward. I don't think that person, I don't know if that person is around. That's that's the thing that seems to me is that somebody with this gift clearly... It's a Greek tragedy, isn't it? It's, it's really a Greek tragedy, yeah. Couldn't have written a better one. To end up being... To be end up being the Joker instead of being the king. Yeah. I don't... I'm not conflicted because I'm not... I know there's me and then there's the show. Jerry Springer might be the only person intimately familiar with Jerry Springer who claims to feel no ambivalence about the place Jerry Springer has ended up. I talked to him in his office before he taped his show. It's hard not to like him. He's engaging, funny. But there's a certain practice quality to the way he answers questions about his career choices. You know, I create this persona for the show, and that's what it is. It's, you know, I'm an act. You know, it's like I'm in movies. You know, no one... I mean, look, no one goes after... um, some actor because let's say he played Hitler in the movies. I, I don't, I, I mean, I'm not saying like anybody should have a, yeah, have an issue with it at all. Here's a person who's like, you know, who's every st- stage of their, of their professional career, it's been imbued with the sense of trying to make a difference until you get to the Springer show. How well, do, we've how certainly you made a difference in television, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I'm not sure people are happy about it. I try not to think about it too much. Um, life is what it is and you take what's handed and you work as hard as you can and hopefully you'll be successful and but I, I just don't spend too much time worrying about that I mean you know I do my show and, I, and look it's I've always said it's a stupid show and you know I've had a wonderful life because of it and all that but I've never for a second thought that it's important you know it's trivial it's chewing gum and I and I recognize that You know, once you do something that's significant in life, all this other stuff is just a way to eat. From talking to Springer and his friends, I think the best answer to the question, how did this idealistic political guy end up in a job where he helps no one, is partly he stumbled into it and was surprised as anyone about how big it got. Once the show started what they euphemistically referred to as targeting the youth market, its success was both instantaneous and breathtaking. Within the span of a couple of years, Springer went from being just another talk show host to a worldwide phenomenon. The Springer Show can be seen on televisions in over 40 countries worldwide, including Tunisia. And when the show's named after you, you get a lot of the money. And the money really meant something to him. He'd come to this country when he was five, the child of Jewish refugees, who escaped to America from Nazi Germany. But there is some evidence that Springer is more ambivalent about his current job than he's willing to let on to a reporter. About four or five years ago, he started making phone calls to his old friend, Mike Ford, who ran several of Springer's political campaigns, just to chat about politics. The more notoriety the show attracted, the more popular it became, the more frequently, it seemed to Mike, Jerry would phone him. We talked, I would say, you know, maybe once a month, and it was always about getting back in. He would call me, and he would say, so what are we going to do? And I would say, well, I'm doing it. I don't know what you're going to do. You know, but it's not happening on the show. And then we talk about options, and we looked at everything. I went down to Mississippi to look at running against Trent Lott. Uh, we looked in New Orleans. We looked everywhere, but especially in Ohio. And, uh, you know, he was he was feeling it out for years. I mean, he was empty, okay? that's the That's the issue here. The show does not make him happy. 
it didn't fill his needs as a person. If you follow the news very closely, you may recall stories in early 2003 that Jerry Springer was considering a run for Senate in Ohio. Much of the national news reported this as a joke, a talk show fool trying to dress up as a statesman. But the small band of Jerry's friends from before knew the story was actually the opposite. A former statesman was trying to shake off the costume of a talk show fool. What this meant for Jerry was going around the state and speaking in front of as many Democrats as he possibly could. Gene Galvin went with him. People say, would you come down to Hawking College and speak? Yes. Will you come to the Mercer County Democratic Party dinner and speak? Yes. Will you come down to Athens County and help a young Ohio University woman running for city council win an election? Yes. He goes. I introduced him to the State Democratic County Chairs Association back in January. Again, Tim Burke. And as I introduced him, you could just see that there was a great deal of skepticism in that room. Because for the most part, the county chairs from around the state of Ohio only knew Jerry for this crazy television show he has. Many of you know him only as a host of some goofy television show. I know him as somebody who cares deeply about people, about politics. I'm proud to introduce you to my longtime friend, Jerry Springer. Thank you very much. May you never be on my show. <laughs> you could literally watch the audience change. From skepticism to an audience that was laughing with Jerry. The tax cuts proposed by the president are obscene. What the hell is he giving someone like me a tax break for? <laughs> the argument, the argument for the tax package, and you've heard it on the television, you hear it all the time. The argument for the tax package is to give people back their money so they'll spend it and will help the economy. Here's what's stupid. You rich people can already afford anything they want to buy. Do you think if I get a check back in the mail, suddenly I'm going to buy something? If I want to buy something now, I'll go out and buy it. <laughs> Don't give me the money. Take that money and make sure that every citizen in the United States of America has health insurance. That's where you spend the money. <laughs> if we would get that message across to the citizens of Ohio, I don't care how Republican your district looks. They will say, uh-huh, that relates to me. Now there's a reason to sign up and vote Democrat. We got to give them a reason. That's what we stand for. We are right on the issues. That's what's so, it just drives me insane when I watch the news and I see this garbage. Look, I'm the king of garbage, so I know garbage. <laughs> And at the end of the speech, he had them all up on their feet. These are a bunch of hard-bitten politicians who've heard lots of political speeches in their lives, and he had them on their feet at the end of the speech. He turned the room just like that. You don't have to be a political strategist, however, to design the attack ad against the Jerry Springer Senate campaign. He airs one himself, twice a day in most markets, for an hour each time. So along with the speeches and the candidate appearances, Mike Ford tried to research the question, could Jerry Springer the man get beyond Jerry Springer the show? Put another way, had Springer forever blown his chance to do the one thing he truly loved doing? We put together more or less focus groups, and we sat him in a room, and instead of asking him questions directly about Jerry, we decided what we should do is, in effect, run a campaign before their eyes that was completely honest about all the things he'd ever done wrong or were distasteful, and then mixing them with a the bio of the guy and then letting him talk to camera about issues. We had uh, impressive voices reading mean, horrible, nasty editorials. They had clips from the show. They had headlines about bad things. They, they saw all the bad, but then they saw a lot of the good. In every market, we started horribly. And every single one of them turned around. In every audience, in every market, and the key thing there was that information is received in inverse proportion to its predictability. So if you said Jerry Springer is dating a llama, 
they would go, yeah, yeah, I saw that in the Inquirer. But then you start to unroll this other stuff. Uh, and and when, then when he looked to camera uh, and started talking about what's going on in the state and in the country, it was completely persuasive because it was all new. But there was one other thing they told Mike Ford. All the people and all the focus groups said the only way they could vote for him was if he quit his show. The voters, it turns out, could get beyond Springer the show to Springer the man, as long as Springer the man did it first. Which is what killed his exploratory bid in the end. He couldn't get out of his TV contract in time to start a Senate race. But he's still out there giving speeches. If you go to the website runjerryrun.com, you'll see five events with Ohio Democratic organizations scheduled next month alone. Springer's been thinking a lot about his message. He hits it in every speech he gives. And it goes something like this. We all believe, Republicans and Democrats alike, that the purpose of government is to provide protection. No one disputes that government should maintain a military or a police force or try to stop terrorists. But Democrats believe that government should protect its citizens from another form of violence as well. The violence of a pink slip on a Friday afternoon that says you've been laid off and now you don't have enough money to take care of your family. You know, job insecurity, the inability to get health insurance, that, that you have to choose, should I take my medicine this month or do I buy my kid a coat for the winter? So the Democratic Party exists in America today to provide protection for middle and low-income America, particularly against economic violence as well as military violence. Has, has doing the show for these, the, the, for these last, you know, eight, ten years, has it, has it sort of informed your, your political thinking in any way? No, it's just confirmed it. I mean, any job I've ever had, it's been the same constituency. It's been middle and low income people that need a voice, that need help, that need whatever. So even in my entertainment, that's my base. And politics certainly was my base. When I practiced law, it was my base. I mean, you know, the, this is who I am. 54 years ago this week, I came to America. I was five years old. Most of my family had been killed in the uh, Holocaust, in the uh, camps in, in Germany and Austria during World War II. The speech that you're hearing now is one Springer delivered back in January of 2003 to a group of Ohio Democratic County chairs. There was no press there, and the only reason we have it on tape is because an audience member recorded the whole thing on a personal tape machine from his chair. Probably he thought it would be a joke, but he was so moved by the speech that he took the tape and had it duplicated at his own expense, sent it around to all the county chairmen around the state. The idea being, here's a guy with a message for us. In the speech, Springer gives a standard economic spiel and also condemns America's current foreign policy as arrogant and bullying. And then he ends with his own story of first coming to America with his refugee parents on a boat from Europe. We came over on the Queen Mary, January 19th to January 24th, a five-day voyage over to America in 1949. And when we arrived, my very first memory was my mom waking me up and saying, Gerald, we have to go up on the top deck there, one of the decks of the Queen Mary. And all I remember, that the rest has been told to me, I was only five, but I vividly remember everyone standing out on top of the ship in the deck there, there were about 2,000 passengers on board, packed together, packed together. And what I remember, other than being freezing, is that nobody said a word. It was absolute quiet. And we were passing the Statue of Liberty. And my mother told me later on, as I got older, because obviously I wouldn't remember exactly what I had said, but she remembers me asking her, what, what are we looking at? And, you know, what does it mean? And she said in German, Ein Tag alles. One day, everything. The Statue of Liberty means everything. We take it for granted today. We take it for granted. Remember, the Statue of Liberty stands for what America is. We as Democrats have to remind ourselves and remind the country the great principles we stand for. This is a place of protection. This is not a country of bullies. We are not an empire. We are the light. We are the Statue of Liberty. Thank you for having me. The elements aren't new. The immigrant experience, help for working people, the Statue of Liberty. 
but the effect is somehow electrifying for the people in that hall and the people passing around this tape. Wouldn't it be funny if in the end what the world really needs is more Jerry Springer? Alex Bloomberg. He was one of the producers of our show. Springer, like I said earlier, died last week at the age of 79. He was on TV till 2021 and did a weekly podcast till just a few months ago. Since the story first aired, Mike Ford, who's the political advisor in Alex's story, has also died. Coming up, so two women, an Orthodox Jew and Donald Trump, walk into a bar. Actually, they walk into the second half of our show, and that happens in just one minute. From Chicago Public Radio, when our program continues. What inspired the design of the new Sun Princess? You. Because you enjoy sweeping views, the Sun Princess's grand atrium was built in a sphere of glass. Because you want amazing entertainment, the ship's performance arena is a total showstopper. Because you love great meals, expect your dining experience to be elevated, three stories high. Princess pondered everything so you can feel the love on the cruise vacation of your dreams. Because on Sun Princess, the sun revolves around you. Call your travel advisor or visit princess.com. Support for this podcast comes from Evernorth Health Services. If you could hear anxiety, it might sound like this. Anxiety is the most common behavioral health concern, yet more than 63% of people living with anxiety don't seek help. Evernorth uses powerful health data to guide people to quality care quickly. Earlier intervention improves behavioral health outcomes while also reducing costs. Find out how Evernorth helps move people and organizations forward at evernorth.com slash behavioral. Hey, it's Ben Fruman, editor-in-chief of Wirecutter. We put together the ultimate moving guide, and I wanted to find out a few of our writers' favorite tips. When you're first moving into your home, make sure that you change the batteries in your smoke detector. Buy a mattress bag. You can carry a mattress more easily because the handles are built in, and it's going to protect your mattress from the truck and the street. Make sure you have towels on hand. You don't want to end up taking a shower and using a dirty sock to dry off. <laughs> yeah. If you're getting ready to move, let Wirecutter help you make a plan at nytimes.com slash moving. This is American Life from Ira Glass. Today's program, stories of people leaving the fold, and like Jerry Springer, having one part of them that stays stuck back in the old days before they left. We've arrived at Act 2 of our show, Act 2, God and Hockey. Shalom Auslander and his wife were raised in religious homes, but they were wobbling away from it, thinking of leaving the fold. But still living in an Orthodox Jewish community in Teaneck, New Jersey, they were huge fans of the hockey team, the New York Rangers, And in 1994, the Rangers had an incredible season. Beat the Islanders, beat the Devils in a seven-game double overtime win, went to the playoffs against Vancouver. And during one of these away games, fans could go, while the team was in Vancouver, for $5 and sit in Madison Square Garden and watch the game on the Jumbotron with other fans. But the problem for this couple was the game was on a Saturday, and religious Jews don't drive on Saturdays. It's against the rules of the religion. Shalom and his wife really, really wanted to go. So this was, you know, this was push coming to shove in terms of the whole God existence thing. We kind of looked at each other, and I, I was all for going. I just said, oh, you know, to hell with it. My, my argument was if, uh, you know, God got them in that position, and uh, it may, <laughs> you know, may, God maybe made the, the Rangers winners. God made, look, he brought over Messier from Canada. He brought over Kovala from Russia. He really went out of his way <laughs> to get these guys into this position to win, and yeah, you know, it was probably a mitzvah to go to go watch them. You know, this commandment to go watch them. What was her argument? Uh, her argument was uh, fear, <laughs> terror, uh, God, revenge. So her feeling was, let's walk. It was. It's about fourteen miles from what we judged. Wait a second. You actually thought that if you if if you drove um, instead of walked, that that God would actually make the team lose? I did. That would be his revenge on you? Really? Yeah. Yeah, I thought, well, I certainly knew that if it did happen, there would be a part of my head that went, oh, nice going. Nice going. They they, they play all season, and then you got to go get in a cab, and now look what happened. <laughs> so so let's walk from New Jersey into into Manhattan, literally like... Yes, literally. In, like Cross some bridge. Down Teaneck Road 
through, uh, you know, walk along the side of Route 4, which is this eight-lane super slab highway, cross the George Washington Bridge, walk down the highway, cross through Harlem, hit Broadway, and then it's 100 blocks down to Madison Square Garden. So we go, and as we're heading along, it's turning out to be quite a longer walk than we thought it was, particularly, you know, in our Sabbath finest, and those are hard shoes. Uh, but her feet are slowly uh, blistering, and it, it's just getting worse and worse, and she's complaining more and more. Um, I mean, it's at the point where she's taking her shoes off and walking, and I don't know how many, you know, how many of you have been in Manhattan, but that's a huge commitment to walk down a Manhattan street in just your socks. Is you've got to be in a lot of pain. So we're we're get by the time we get there, sort of the euphoria of the game took over, and it was just really great to be there. But we we didn't really consider God much after that until the Rangers lost. I think they lost 4-1 or something. It just it wasn't it was ridiculous. And the game just ended and everyone just starts filing out miserably and we're just standing there just dumbfounded. I mean, not only do we now hate the Rangers, but my we're just theologically we're spiraling. And the moment that final buzzer rang, my wife looked at me and said, "We should have driven." It was just that kind of all right, if this is the way he's going to play, if this is the kind of game he's playing, then uh, we're not having any of it. And we left the, we left the garden. I just had, I had a sidewalk hot dog. I was like, I'm strictly non-kosher from now on. But, <laughs> yeah. Take that. Yeah. How do you like that? <laughs> Where can I get a Slim Jim around here? And a milk. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I never thought about, like, this is the downside of having a personal relationship with God, is that you'd constantly be bearing a grudge. I thought it was all just, like, reassurance and stuff from God all the time. He's there in times of need. I never thought that people, like, you could actually just feel, like, a grudge against him for something like this. Well, you know, it's, it depends what kind of God you're picturing. I, I came from a kind of, you know, incredibly, the normally incredibly dysfunctional family with a pretty overbearing father. So as a kid, you go into, like, these, you know, Hebrew schools— you're hearing our Father who art in heaven, and I'm going, oh God, tell me there's not another one up in heaven. <laughs> He's right. bad enough at home. He's bad enough at home. Well, it's so interesting. Then you say that I realize that as you say that, like, like my image of God is exactly. I've never put this together in my life. Is exactly my image of my Father, but bigger, which which is which is. Um, He's usually not around. Sometimes he'll take an interest. He means well, but mostly he's kind of like you're on your own. Yeah, that wasn't mine. I, I wish that were mine. Mine was uh, a god in heaven, you know, lumbering around in his underpants, half drunk on Ketam wine, looking to <laughs> yell at somebody. <laughs> so, so I picture that guy watching the Ranger game going, yeah, the hell with you, buddy. <laughs> yeah. So you have this, this moment with the team. Does this actually have consequences past that that week? You know, I think it helped hasten the slide. I think it was... It was the week after we uh, was the first time that we just ignored the fact that it was Sabbath, and I think our our big our big God revolution at that point was to get in our car and go to a mall, and that was the big one for us. Sabbath was the big one. That's the hard one to get past. So this happened a decade ago. Have there been times that you missed being religious, having that life, having that community? Is there some part of it that you've missed along the way? No, because I gave up the practice of it. But, uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, my family or the people from that community or anybody I went to school with would look at me and say, oh, he's completely irreligious and not spiritual at all. But the, the truth is I'm, I kind of feel like the most religious person I know because I still haven't quite gotten that God out of my head. He's still there. He still makes comments. There's always the picture of a big old frowning man in the back of the room shaking his head saying, you're going to pay for this. So I could, I could say I don't believe in it, but that's not going to get that character out of my life. And I don't know why I can't just give it up. I wish I could. Shalom Auslander. The story appears in his memoir, Foreskin's Lament. His most recent book is a novel called Mother for Dinner. Act three, would you like to come up to first class? Sometimes something happens to you that you'd like to walk away from and never think about again. 
but you find you can't. Like, for instance, you had an indelible experience with Donald Trump. That's what the journalist E. Jean Carroll says happened to her. These last two weeks, she's been in court. She's the accuser in the rape trial of Donald Trump that's been happening in New York City. Carol says that back in the 1990s, Donald Trump raped her in a dressing room in the department store Bergdorf Goodman. He says she's lying, that her case is a, quote, complete con job, a hoax. She's suing him for defamation and for battery. She's one of dozens of women who've accused the former president of sexual assault and harassment over the years. The former president denies all their allegations. These stories have been so widely covered, and everybody's so used to them. The few years back, to Carol, it felt like at that point they were just being ignored, which seemed kind of incredible to her. It killed her that these stories just somehow didn't seem to matter. And so she decided to try to do something about it. She had a bunch of conversations with other women who've accused the president, and she published them in a series of stories in The Atlantic. And her idea was most people only have a vague sense of these stories and don't really have much of a sense of what these women say actually happened. And her thought was that by diving into the details of the story, she would restore them to human size in full color. She adapted one of the articles that she wrote back then for us. We first aired this back in 2020. This particular one is with one of Donald Trump's accusers named Jessica Leeds, who actually testified in E. Jean Carroll's trial these past two weeks. Warning about content before we start. This is a frank conversation about alleged sexual assault. Here's E. Jean Carroll. Let me set the scene. Midsummer twilight, and Jessica Leeds and I are letting down what's left of our hair. Jessica's in her elegant crib in the Blue Ridge Mountains. I'm in my little shack just off the Appalachian Trail, and we're zooming like two old screech owls, discovering how much we have in common, which includes our love for Mr. Paul Newman, our age, and our height. How tall are you now? Well, I'm I'm five seven now. I was okay. five nine at the. Right. I've lost two inches. Me too. I've lost two inches. I don't know. I don't know where they've gone, but I've lost them. I love being tall. When I was working, I was always so thankful. Yeah, me too. That I was tall. About forty years ago, when Jessica was working as a salesperson for a company that sold newsprint to publications like the Washington Post. She sat down next to Donald Trump on an airplane. Let me just say that if you have never Zoomed with a silver-haired, soigné, 78-year-old woman who describes what it's like being strapped in a seat on a Braniff Airlines flight with a future president of the United States trying to fasten his lips on her like a six-foot-two suckfish, well... In my opinion, you have not lived, let alone Zoomed, at all. But before we board that flight, a refresher. Jessica was one of the first women to publicly accuse Trump of sexual assault in 2016. It was on the front page of the New York Times. I knew if the story did get any attention that the first thing Trump would say is that I wasn't pretty enough. Right. I knew, I knew instinctively that that's what he was going to say. How did Jessica know? Because Jessica is an old bat. Old bats are the best, even better than screech owls. I'm an old bat myself. We old bats don't kid ourselves. And, in fact, one day after the New York Times published a story about what happened to Jessica on that plane in 1980... Trump yammered about her accusations at a rally. Oh, I was with Donald Trump in 1980. I was sitting with him on an airplane. And he went after me on the plane. Yeah, I'm going to go after. Believe me, she would not be my first choice, that I can tell you. You don't know. That would not be my first choice. I told Jessica the same thing happened to me. I knew it was coming, too. I knew it, of course, and then he said about me, he, she's not right. my type. Because they're running pictures of me when I'm 75 years old. Right. And it's not fair. If they had right. run pictures of me as I looked, you and I caught tons of shit because we're older women. For the honor of Jessica Leeds and old bats everywhere, Jessica is a beauty now, 
And she was a beauty 40 years ago when she got on that flight to New York. And as she remembers it, it was a Braniff flight. Braniff was the chic airline. Her seat would have been full grain leather. Her flight attendant would have been clad in Halston. And her plane, it would have been painted in Persis green, mercury blue, or sparkling burgundy. And so what were you wearing? Do you remember when you got on that plane? Yep. I had my best suit was, was a brown tweed. Oh, I love that suit. And, and it was jacket and, and a skirt. It was a fabulous outfit. It really was. I never wore it again after that day, though. I hung on to it for quite a while, but I never wore it again. I know exactly what she means. It was the same for me with the dress I had on at Bergdorf's. I didn't want to throw it away because it was a beautiful Donna Karen. I would never throw it away, but I couldn't put it on because bad things happen. Yeah, like, exactly. Okay, so isn't that interesting? We have so much in common. So, all right, so you were, now tell me what happened. You get on the plane. I get on the plane and I had, I was sitting in the back and I remember watching the stewardess come walking down the aisle and she saw me and she said, would you like to come up to first class? We have, we have space. Never occurred to me not to say yes. And I gathered my, my purse and I went up to first class. That had happened before. Yeah, it's happened to me too. Yeah, I kind of accepted the fact that it was entertainment for the big honchos up in first class. Now, I don't understand if people understand what we're talking about, but that's what they did. They chose the yeah. looking yeah. best dressed people and put them up in first. That's right. What we're talking about is how things used to be. Buying a ticket, putting on our best clothes, hopping on a cocktail party, heading for New York or Chicago or Miami or any jazzy city USA. And this party lacked zip unless somebody very rich or very pretty was present. Men in first class would size up the female passengers before boarding and hold a brief conference with the check-in crew. Or, alternately, a helpful flight attendant would simply stand in the aisle waving people away and rearranging the seating chart so that an extremely tall chap, for instance, with black hair like grease felt, could have the spot by me, which is what I told Jessica had happened on a jumbo jet to L.A., after the plane took off, following the meal, the chap shows me a photo of his private plane. Then he shows me a photo of his Rolls Royce. Then he shows me his erection. It would never have occurred to me to call anybody and say anything. Mm -hmm. We grew up expecting men to make a pass. At. I was not surprised. I expected it from men. Je uh, Jessica, you and I were born during the Second World War. Mm-hmm. We did not report, we expected it, and we laughed. But, you know, we were wrong. We were wrong. We should have spoken up, you know, like they're doing now. Well, we, we were so thankful, though. Oh, to have, I know to have the fucking job. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Oh, my Lord. The flight attendant escorts Jessica to the front of the plane. She sits down in the aisle seat beside Donald Trump. As I recall, he introduced himself. The name meant nothing to me. It wouldn't I, have. Well, this I was 1979-1980. Jessica wasn't a native New Yorker. Was she was not yet aware of all the levels, the ranks, the spheres of New York society that Trump, a young rat out of Queens, was chewing his way through. So, he was very good looking in 1980. Do you agree? Well, I found him very attractive in 1996. Yeah. He was very pretty. Yeah, I guess. I, you know, I, I... He was not ugly. I can remember... I don't remember my, my reaction. I, he was perfectly reasonable when I first sat down. I mean, it was blonde, tall, good size man, that sort of stuff. But I, I don't remember being overwhelmed by his looks. Or, Did he uh, ask you about yourself? What did we talk about? We talked about him. I 
remember we took off and they served this wonderful meal. And then they, they came and they picked up everything. And within a short amount of time, all of a sudden, he's like on me like a wet blanket. Did he try to kiss you first? Yes. Yes. She glances away from the screen with a revolted wince. It was such a shock. It was like all of a sudden he's like on me. Jessica is ladylike. Therefore, allow me, for I have experience with Trump, to say in plain English what I believe Trump is about to do. I believe he will go straight for the crotch, just like he brags on the Access Hollywood tape. This man who today claims that he has never kissed or groped a woman without consent. It's like he's got four extra hands because he's grabbing my breasts. He's trying to kiss me. I'm trying to get his hands off of me. And this kind of struggle went on for a little while. And then it's when he started to put his hand up my skirt that I got a jolt of, of strength and managed to wiggle myself out of, of, the, of the seat. Jessica grabs her purse and storms to the back of the plane. Now, wait, so did he make it all the way to your panties or not? No, no. Because you had by that time started to stand up, right? Right. Was there anybody else? Well, yeah, there was, the, there was the guy across the aisle whose eyes were about the size of a saucer. And I kept thinking, <laughs> why don't you say something? Or where is, where is the stewardess on this whole thing? You know, why doesn't somebody come and rescue me? And that's when I realized there was only me that was going to rescue me. So that's when I... I'll, well, I'm it, glad you thought of... I'm th- See, some women freeze in this situation. Yes, yes. I know. You didn't freeze. No, no. But I certainly didn't say anything. I didn't, I didn't say anything either. I didn't scream. I didn't no. do anything. I laughed. Did you laugh? Yeah. No, I don't recall laughing. No. I, I took it seriously. I mean, I, I, this, this was a real physical attack. And oh, no, it's an attack, an assault. Yeah. Although we talk about Trump groping women, most people don't understand how brazen Trump really is because no one knows what groping means. It's one of the reasons I wanted to talk to the Trump accusers. Who knows what the heck Trump is actually doing or on what part of the female body he is doing it? One of Trump's accusers described for me Trump putting his hand up her skirt and onto her vulva, and she used the plain English. It was like a squish, she said, a squeeze. And she made a motion with her hand like squeezing a rubber duck. That is groping. So why does Trump do it? Jessica and I ponder. Let's try to figure this out. The main question is, he knows he's not going to be able to have intercourse with you on the plane. He knows this. Why does he do this? Why, what did he think he was going to gain? Did it, was it sexual? Did he, were you turning him on to such an extent that he couldn't stand it? What was it? Well, I, personally, I, I can't, I think, I thought he was bored. Oh. <laughs> Nothing happening, you know, oh, so let's, let, let's, let's grab a little pussy here, you know. This oh, is, this is such an insight to me. This is such an insight. Got it. But Got it. it it goes along with his Hollywood tape. And no atten- he has no attention span. No. No. Was he reading it all beforehand? Did no. Did no. Newspaper? Nope. Who get on a plane in 1980 without a ton of magazines and newspapers in the Wall Street? Exactly. And he had nothing to read? Nope. He thought he was bored. That is an insight that I think it really sends it home. Because some people have claimed he does it for power. I don't think it has anything to do with power. Well, could be. Uh, but I, I, I really kind of just chalked it off to him being bored. So Trump grabs one woman. Then he grabs the next woman. And the next woman. And pretty soon, we start thinking Trump grabbing women is normal. Then Trump grabbing women becomes so normal, 
is born. It is old news, and there's so much that he's done. But Jessica, it's not old news. We're the most current thing. We tried to warn people. We tried to warn America. This is mm-hmm. who he was. And so now we seem to have been forgotten. We've been pushed. Well, we've been ignored. And this drives me crazy. This is why we're doing this. Women like Jessica and I will never forget. How often did you think about this between then and 2015 when he came to the fore again, you know? I probably would not have had it so emblazed in my mind if it hadn't been for the gala at Saks Fifth Avenue. The gala at Saks Fifth Avenue. This is a year or two after the flight, and it's a benefit for the Humane Society of New York and a few other charities. Jessica is the assistant to the president of the Humane Society and is handing out table assignments. I had this fabulous dress. Oh, what was it? Let me hear. (laughs) Mary McFadden. Oh, I love Mary McFadden. Pleated all these little pleats in a taxi cab yellow. And I show up at Saks, and I've got this great dress on and I'm doing my thing and I'm meeting Jeffrey Bean, I'm meeting Bill Blass, I'm meeting all of these designers for this party. And in fact, Mary McFadden came up and looked at me and said, that's my dress. And I said, yes, it is. (laughs) So it was was really a fabulous, a fabulous eating. And then Trump with his wife, Ivana, came up she was pregnant, very pregnant. And he looked at me when I handed him his table assignment. And I'm looking at him thinking, you're the asshole from the airplane. I remember you. The future president of the United States remembers Jessica too. And he looked at me and he said, I remember you. You're the cunt from the airplane. E. Jean Carroll is a journalist and the author of the memoir, What Do We Need Men For? Her series of conversations with women who accused Donald Trump of sexual assault is at the Atlantic.com website. It's called I Moved on Her Very Heavily. Her story was produced for our show by Susan Burton.